Church. Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. All right. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, from the other end of Long Island, it's John. Barely Long Island. Barely Long Island. Yeah, you're on the border of Queens. One foot... Yeah, one foot away from uh, from Queens. Uh, you know what, dude? There, w- there was a couple things that I, I I just wanted to touch on from from last week or two weeks ago, rather. Catlin's story in a Clash of Kings. Wrote down the notes. While you're searching, I'll just talk real quickly. Um, haven't heard much of anything for season uh, number eight. Supposedly, the actor who plays Jagged Hagar was located. That was uh, spotted near the uh, near the set. Oh, jeez, really? So, yeah, you know, I, I know there's like theories that he, that, that you know, the, the the faceless men are working with the others somehow. It just, I'm just trying to figure out how, unless unless he was just there, you know, by chance visiting the set. Hopefully, visiting you know, and they went out and they were spotted. You know, it's six feature length episodes. Fine, but that, well, that's not even confirmed. I don't think that they're all feature length. Movie episodes. No, it's yeah. I think a lot. I guess basically, I think Kit Harrington. I think he came out and said, like, "Yeah," right. which is fine. It should be, but how do you bring back Jack and Hagar? What the fuck has he got to do with anything? Like that, you know what I mean? Like that story's over. You're really gonna bring them back around? Unless, they, unless there's a twist. Unless there's a twist, we just don't see. Yeah, or don't want to see. I will. I will say this. Probably talked about it in the previous Catlin chapters episodes. That there's a theory going around that Peter Baelish is not actually dead in him. He took the role. He took on. Uh, oh boy! <laughs> but yeah, I've not seen any reports of him being involved in any of the shooting. So hopefully that squashes that. Uh, yeah, we don't need this stuff. We don't need these B character returns. This is the end of the story. We, we just need to deal with the main conflict. That's all we need. That's all I want. I'm not looking for Peter Baelish to come back and, and do what? Like, what is he going to do? <laughs> He's not going to win. Sansa, Hello. I told you chaos was about to... I still love you. Be my queen. Okay. Well, all right, since you're still alive. You've done no harm to any of my family members. Just a couple things I wanted to touch on from the last episode. The first was, it was Catelyn's point of view, it's real Catelyn's point of view, but Lord Rickard Karstark and his need for vengeance on the Lannisters and mm-hmm. the anger he has at Rob suing for peace or giving terms to Cleos Frey and sending him to King's Landing. A, he had to have... I guess he didn't. He got so angry, but if he had just listened to the terms, he would have realized that Rob really had no intention of suing for peace. Yeah, as we discussed, the terms were kind of, like, really outlandish. Like, really, better chance to be married to Salma Hayek than uh, <laughs> Tyler Lannister and, you know, and Joffrey Baratheon agreeing to any of those terms. They're ridiculous. Ridiculous terms. And Catelyn did have a good point. Nothing can be done to bring back Rickard Karstark's sons. And you said it also. What do you expect in war? Sons sons die. Right. Everybody that dies is a son or a daughter. In Westeros, just a son. So although I think that although you and Catelyn agree on this, I think the difference is that Catelyn is full of shit. She doesn't care about House Karstark. No, she has no idea. Of course not. She only cares right. about She doesn't care about their effort to Rob's war and... As we saw at the end of the last episode, when the war changes shape for House Stark, right? When they lose Winterfell, she sacrifices the safety of every son in the North and the Riverlands and her own son by releasing Jaime Lannister from the dungeons of River Run. You agree with Catelyn Stark, the difference being she is full of shit and you are not. It's like, who cares about your son? All that matters is I'm going to release Jaime so I can get my two daughters back. That's all that matters. Well, one daughter. Maybe. That's the other thing. She doesn't even a confirmation of Arya. Exactly. That's why I'm just going to say that. She has like no idea that, you know, that she's, you know, hook, line, sinker has been paying, you know, is listening to Fring and Baelish. She's got this belief that Arya is there also. And that's not even true. It's almost like she can switch off and on when she's going to be, when she's going to have foresight, when she's going to think like a noble lady of high birth 
or when she's just going to be like like a panicked mom or like just a selfish old lady who thinks life has passed her by. Right. And she's able to, to jump between these characters within herself. She's like bipolar. Yeah. I would like for her for her character to have like a psychological analysis and she may come <laughs> off as bipolar or like definitely a sociopath. Yeah. Okay, the other thing regarding regarding sending Theon to Pike. This is like the one move that she really that she was definitely right about. Yes, but and obviously Rob's decision is wrong in hindsight, but I think his idea to send Theon I don't think it was so short-sighted on his part. Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I get from both the Theon chapters in A Clash for Kings and the show, more so in the show, is that Theon had every intention of assisting his foster brother. Mm -hmm. But he also had every intention of taking advantage of Rob's good fortune in war. It's Balon Greyjoy that creates the problem for House Stark. Theon's not innocent, but you understand that he would side with his father and his house to side with the Ironborn. So Catelyn wasn't wrong to question Rob's decision, but I don't think she did such a good job in explaining what she thought the problem would be, right? It seems like she had the foresight to think that it was a bad idea to send away their Ironborn hostage. She was looking at it as, don't trust the Greyjoys, don't trust Balon. Your father kept him at bay because of Theon. I don't think she explained that, though. I'm sure that's the way she looked at it, but I don't think she explained yeah, but it that she, way. But she also didn't explain, listen, you know, they're... Right now, they can send their ships right into the north and take the north if he turns. It's just, you it's know? an army at your back if you lose. Theon is what's keeping Balon under control. So if you give up Theon, then Balon's not under control. And that could be a big problem. Right. I don't think anybody really knew what Balon, the lengths he would go to. You know, but Catelyn had an idea. I think she could have done a better job persuading Rob to not send Theon. Mm -hmm. And she could have used that as a way of building Rob's trust in her. Her idea, though, San Ruiz Bolton, would have been like San Ruiz Bolton. Yeah, that might, be, that might even be worse. <laughs> um, Is any fuck-up you could do, Rob? I could do better. Well, it's just like, if, you know, if, if Catelyn explains this situation better to Rob, and Rob is a real king, he would understand. If he's trying to be like Ned, he would understand. So it angers me that Catelyn wasn't able to explain that. It's like, she's like, ah, that's a bad idea, but, you know, well, whatever. I gotta, you know, I, I gotta figure out how I'm gonna fucking get in a better position. So I'm sure it'll be okay. And then just one, one correction involving the Conningtons and Brienne of Tarth. When we were talking about Catelyn arriving at King Renly's host at Bitterbridge, mm -hmm. she observes a knight bearing the colors and sigil of House Tarth. This knight, who is Brienne of Tarth, on horses, Sir Red Ronnet Connington. And I said that we knew full well that Red Ronnet's cousin is one of our favorite characters, John Connington. But they're not cousins. I think they're second cousins. Because Red Ronnet's father, Ronald, is actually John Connington's cousin. Right. Ah, still yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, you know, it's like, you know what, it's like when I was kids, like, you know, like, you go, oh, that, oh, that's your, that's your yeah. second cousin once yeah. removed. It's like the Italian. <laughs> like, removed? Like, what, 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 the Italian definition of cousin. Like, like, what happened? They, they were taken away from the family at one point for a short period of time without their back? Yeah, once removed, twice removed, whatever, you know. And that's it. I mean, unless you got something, let's get going on uh, on Storm of Swords, where Catelyn only has seven chapters. Short and sweet, Lady Catelyn. Mm -hmm. Short, but definitely not sweet. Well, sweet sweet for one chapter. But bittersweet. Bittersweet. Yeah. The the overlaying gray areas of what George likes to paint. <laughs> in this way, this horrific massacre that the only bad thing, and the only, really, only really horrific massacre about this was Grey Wind's death um, and the North's death. But Rob dying and Catelyn dying was definitely in my eyes. Specifically, Catelyn just was a great feeling. Well, they brought it on themselves. Yeah. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but has the Red Wedding changed for you at all? You know, reading it that first time and how, just how crazy it was and how unbelievable. Well, when we get up to a little toy, I want to say, let's, because yeah. now this, this is the book now that I'm reading the book first before the show. Right, so. yeah, right, because the first two books, you it was show first. Yeah, I, I saw the show first. Okay, yeah. All right, well, uh, let's get going then. A Storm of Swords, Catelyn 1. And where we left Catelyn, she had just, well, it was somewhat ambiguous, but she released Jamie Lannister. Brienne of Tarth will accompany him to King's Landing. She's hoping that Tyrion Lannister will 
return Sansa and Arya for his brother. <laughs> Total shot in the dark. It's like a... Uh, it's a rainbow. Yeah. I'm really, I'm getting to Dio now lately, and it's like he has this song. It's a rainbow in the dark. That's pretty much what it was. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a fart in the wind. Yeah, yeah, more like a fart in the wind. It was a spinal tap, a break like the wind. Uh, Sir Desmond and Uther, whatever the fuck this guy's name is. Sir Desmond is the, I think he's a Castellan, Castellan for uh, River Run. They meet with Catelyn, and they try to decide what must be done with her. They do not want to put her in chains. So they decide she must be, you know. It's, it's like so ridiculous that they're, they're, you actually have to like, they're like talk about arresting the mother of your king. Well, they're like they're like walking on eggshells around her too. They're still trying to be polite to her because she's the daughter of Hastatoli. It's pretty crazy what she does. They decide she must be confined to a cell until Edmure returns because Edmure's going to know what to do. <laughs> uh, Catelyn suggests her father's chambers instead, so she can comfort him in his final days, and they consent. Lord Hoster wakes up when she arrives. She speaks, and Hoster calls her Tansy, not knowing who she is. Catelyn asks who Tansy is, and Hoster answers that she will have many trueborn sons. Uh, Maester Vyman comes in to put him back to sleep, and uh, Tansy, of course, we find out is the Tansy T. I I think it was a T, right? That mm-hmm. Lysa used to abort Peter Baelish's baby in her belly. Uh, Maester Vyman comes in to put him back to sleep. Catelyn asks if he knows any Tansy, but he does not. Now, like, how do neither one of them know about Tansy T? I I mean, they're adults in... Eh, whatever. That evening, he returns with a meal and word that... You th- I don't know how to say his name. Euthyrdes. U-T-H-E-R-Y-D-E-S. Euthyrdes. is quite sure that no one named Tansy has ever worked at the castle. <laughs> the, the, fucking, <laughs> the big Tansy mystery. Uh, Catelyn had noticed the arrival of a raven earlier and asks what news it brought. Mr. Vyman tells her it is from Rob. He took a wound, storming the crag. But it's not serious. Catelyn puzzles on what her father said and concludes that Lysa must have lost a child before Lord Hoster made Lord John marry her as his price for adding his strength to Robert's rebellion. She writes a letter to Lysa urging her to come or at least send a letter and gives it to the maester. Later that day, a commotion outside heralds Ed Muir's return. Ed Muir's triumphant return. Two hours, two hours later, he comes to her. He informs her of Stannis' defeat and berates her for freeing Jaime. He tells her that he has sent ravens off to Lord Roos at Harrenhal, telling him to be on guard, and offered a thousand gold dragons for Jaime's recapture. Catelyn, lost in her grief, tells him to leave. And I believe she calls him foolish or, or something along those lines. It's kind of like, why would you do that? That's so stupid. And poor Edmure. Like, what do you mean, why would he? He's trying to get back Jamie. Like, that's. <laughs> he's trying to protect your son. You're obviously not. You need Jamie. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's the key to the whole war. That's the key to House Stark's survival. You need Jamie. You need Jamie healthy. You need Jamie somewhat happy. You just need Jamie. You need Jamie. So, of course. At the least, at the very least, breathing in your own in, in, in custody. Yeah. Catelyn, too. She hears the dogs go crazy in the kennels and knows that Rob must have returned with Grey Wind. So this has to be, I'm not sure how much time has passed, but for Rob to get from the crag, wounded, heal, and then return to River Run, traveling through Westeros could take a long time or could take a really short time. But you got to think at least... At least a month has passed, right? I mean, just even looking at the... Um, this is chapter 15. So I already had 12 chapters have been in between. Right, yeah, because that was chapter 2, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that in itself kind of lends you to believe that there's been at least some time in between the, those events. I just decided <laughs> to, uh, you know, make up that it was a month. And when I put my other chapter out, I go against that. It was only two days after that. I do get, I do get, kind of get comfort thinking that Catelyn's been locked up with her father for like a month, unable to leave, wondering what Tansy is. She hears the dogs go crazy in the kennels, and she knows Rob has returned with Grey Wind. Edmure has shunned her since their one meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so she has mostly been left alone with Lord Hoster. Who's probably senile. Oh, dude. He's probably like, kill me. <laughs> Get her the fuck out of here and kill me. What could he possibly be talking about? I don't know what he means. He must be talking about Lysa. 
Talking about you. Get out of here. <laughs> One night she heard a lot of angry shouting and saw a group of 40 men led by Sir Perwin and Martin leave the castle after trampling a Stark banner. <laughs> She's fallen apart, but Maester Vyman refuses to tell her what happened. Sir Desmond eventually comes for her and tells her that Rob awaits her in the Great Hall. Now, I will say this. Knowing what we know about Catelyn, who she pretends to be and who she really is, seeing these Frey men storm off, trampling the Stark banner, and Maester Vyman not telling her what's going on, that's gotta, that has to eat her alive. That must be like mm-hmm. the most painful thing for somebody like Catelyn. Not yeah. being able to know what's going on, like every yeah, she, she needs to know. Wait, she needs to be in the know. Right. And she's not even involved in this. When she arrives at the Great Hall, most of Rob's bannermen are already attending him. The Great John, the Small John, Lady Mage, Lord Jason Malister, Lord Titus Blackwood, Sir Edmure, and Sir Brendan Blackfish. Listen, I know he has no hand. Sir Brendan Blackfish is the unofficial hand to the king. Catelyn is surprised to see an unfamiliar group of people on the dais with Rob. Euthydes bangs his staff as she comes forward. She tells Rob that she freed Jamie for her girls. Because Rob <laughs> Rob probably wouldn't be able to figure that out. <laughs> Do you need to spell that for you, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> did, did, did you see Jamie last around here? Have you seen him lately? <laughs> Neither is no one else. <laughs> yeah. Mom, I went to check Jamie's cell and he wasn't there. Oh, right. About yes. this. I freed him for the girls. Oh, the girls here? Well, no, but... You know, They're on their way. Don't worry. They'll be here. We can trust the Lannisters. Lord Rickard lashes out at her angrily because he has been denied vengeance for his sons. This fucking guy and his sons, man. The Great John tells him <laughs> to go... Like, I get it, but like, dude. The Great John tells him to go easy as it was only a mother's folly. <laughs> That's kind of, that has to piss her off, too. Rob stops the bickering and gives Catelyn his forgiveness by, yeah, by saying he knows what it means to commit a folly for love causing Rickard to storm out angrily. Rob says he must speak with her and his uncles alone and ends the court. Catelyn realizes that Grey Wind is not at Rob's side where he belongs. As the noble... This is just fucking falling apart. It's two chapters, bro. Two chapters of the whole fucking thing. Well, I guess three if you count the last Catelyn chapter of the Clash of Kings, but mm-hmm. the wheels are fucking off, bro. As the nobles file out, Lady Mage and the Great John give their sympathy and understanding to Catelyn while Galbert, Lord Jason, and Lord Jonas are cool but polite. When the hall empties, all that remains are Rob, Edmure, Brendan, Catelyn, and the six strangers on the dais. Rob introduces them to his mother as Lady Sybil Westerling, wife of Lord Gowan, her brother, Sir Rolf Spicer, Castellan of the Crag, and Lord Gowan's children, Sir Reynold, Elena, Rollum, his new squire, and Jane, his new wife. Ba ba ba! <laughs> Wah, wah. Catelyn created the monster here. I think Catelyn right here is like realizing, okay, this is why he wasn't so upset at me because he's just as much of a jerk that as I am. And I can't be mad at him because... <laughs> he can't be mad at yeah, me. No. <laughs> and she realizes these things, but not once does she say, oh, maybe my my quick decision making and selfishness has really rubbed off on Rob. Like She takes no accountability whatsoever for her teenage son's fucking decision-making. Catelyn's taken aback, but realizes that Rob has snared her by forgiving her for freeing Jamie out of love for her daughters. She cannot object now. The Westerlings take their leave. Catelyn mentions that the Westerlings are sworn to Lord Tywin, and Rob says that Lord Jason captured Lord Gowan at the Whispering Wood and is holding him at Seaguard. He will be freed immediately. Catelyn also points out that Rob has now lost House Frey. Rob explains what happened. He's like, yeah, I know, but here's what happened. He took the crag by storm, with the Great John and Black Walder leading scaling parties over the walls. Rob commanded a ram at the gate and took an arrow in the arm. The wound festered, and Jane had him moved to her own bed and looked after him. She was there when he learned that Theon had killed Bran and Rickon, and she comforted him. They wed the next day. Rob might have been able to reason with Sir Steverin, but Sir Ryman and Black Walder would have none of it and left. Olivar wanted to stay on as his squire, but Ryman did not allow it. So Sir Steverin, he... I think he died in the Whispering Wood, right? Sir Steverin? Sir Steverin was the heir to House Frey, and he's not a TV character, but by all accounts in the book, mm-hmm. he was a lot more congenial than 
Walder. Right. Uh, a lot more reasonable. Likeable. And even the phrase that we get a vibe of the twins from, they were all comfortable with the idea that Sir Stevron would become the Lord of the Crossing. And once he's dead, kind of like all bets are off. Sir Ryman and Black Walder, are, they're more like their father than Sir Stevron. More like their father, but also worse than their father. Because their father, as much of a dick as Walder Frey is, he does take care of his whole family. There's nothing to stop Black Walder. As of the end of A Dance with Dragons, I don't think Black Walder is the heir. I think there's still one more guy in front of him. But if a guy like Black Walder took over the crossing, like he would just he'd, he'd kick out a bunch of Freys because they're just mouths to feed. It wouldn't be like Walder where he's trying to marry them and, and just trying to look out for everybody. So Sir Ryman and Black Walder would have none of it from Rob. Sir so Stevron, he feels he might have been able to reason with. The Great John thought that they should attack the Freys then and there, but Rob knew that would lead to disaster. Rob hopes that Lord Walder will accept a compromise of some sort, but Catelyn does not believe he will. Not only did Rob break his promise, but he married the daughter of a house with lesser standing. They are an old house, tracing their lineage back to the first men, and another Jane Westerling was wife to King Magor 300 years ago. But Frey is more wealthy and more powerful. Catelyn asks why Grey Wind is not there, and Rob responds that Jane is uneasy around him, and he growls around Sir Rolf. Catelyn says he should send Sir Rolf away on some pretext. She firmly believes that direwolves were sent by the old gods as protectors. Rob used to think so until he learned what Theon did to Bran and Rickon. Now, hold on a second. She believes they were sent by the old gods as protectors. She doesn't believe in the old gods, right? Mm -hmm. She doesn't believe in the old gods. And now, all of, all of a sudden, she believes the direwolves were sent by the old gods as protectors. Dude, she's psychotic. There's no other way to explain explain it. She's psychotic. You can say, yeah, or she's selfish. She's wrapped up in her own head. She's only thinking about herself fine. But she's also psychotic. I, I also just want to make a quick point also that... <laughs> Not even the fact that Rob married Jane Westerling, right. but the the speed that it happened. Yeah, there was no like you know, there was definitely no thought there. It's like she comforted me, Brian Ricken, boom, we're married. Next thing you know, we're you know, it's like all in like in a snap of a finger, like you know, like a Thanos snap, you know. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. just like boom, done. What I was gonna say before was. And, and I kind of said it, was that Rob made a Catelyn-like decision. And he did in that it was like, dude, what the fuck are you doing? Don't you realize the ramifications of what you've done? So if you think about him marrying Jane Westerling with the bigger picture, with the ramifications, yeah, it's a Catelyn, that's a Catelyn decision, dude. Maybe not quite like a textbook Catelyn decision, but that's heavily inspired by Catelyn Stark. On the other hand, there is a lot of Ned in this decision. He took this girl's virginity. She's a noble, a noble girl, and he wants to do the right thing mm -hmm. by her. I mean, do you see any contrast between that and everything Ned's done with his life to protect Lyanna, to protect John? Uh, it's anyway, it's two different subject matters, kind of. Ned went out of his way to protect the promise. Rob has gone out of his way to break a promise. Yeah. Maybe there are parallels that they, you know, they go to these extremes, but, you know, Rob has that telly blood in him that does the reverse what Ned did. Well, what would Ned have done in this situation? If Ned was storming the crag, he got wounded, and... The Lady of the Crag, well, not quite the Lady of the Crag, but, you know, the, 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 the oldest child of Lord Gowan Westerling had him moved to her bedroom, and then he got word that his brothers had died. So I, I just, I can't, I can't see him breaking the promise to Walter Frey. No. Ned wouldn't have done that. And that's the difference. But Rob did, and then he tried to make it right. It's like he made the Catelyn decision, and then he tried to be like Ned about the decision. So he made he made a bad decision, a wrong move, and then instead of thinking about his fucking kingdom in the north and the Riverlands, he's thinking about this young girl's honor, who, by the way, is sworn to the Lannisters. And it's boneheaded. It's stupid. It makes you so frustrated that Rob, for me, I'm sure for you, you lose a lot of respect for Rob. But there was... Not innocence, but there was 
it, it is an attempt by him to do what he thought was the right thing. Right. And you, you know what, too? You, you always felt that even with this mistake, he'd somehow bounce back. Well, you want to believe that. Yeah. Like you, you go in there, you read it, it's like, all right, he'll find a way. And the differences in reading this book the first time around compared to doing a reread is when you read this, you're thinking, okay, he, he's going to be able to schmooze all the phrase somehow. He'll do something. It'll be made up. Like, the, you know, there's, there's going to be something. You read the second time, you're just like, Irreparable. Yeah. Well, it's second time, third, you know, third time when you look at it now, it's, listen, they lost the war when she released Jamie. They were in trouble. Even though they had won every battle, they were in trouble but just because they're outclassed, they're outmanned. Mm-hmm. But they were okay with Jamie. They lost it when she released Jamie. But they still, with the phrase, they still could have, you know, a couple breaks. Hung around, right? They could have hung around in there for right, right, a break to go their way. I mean, basically, this is like the the most costly fuck in the history of the North, right? Because he has sex with this girl, and then all of a sudden you lose the phrase. And shortly after that, you lose the car starts. And it gets to a point where, and we'll get to that, uh, it's probably the next chapter, where he's beheading his own lords. Mm -hmm. It's fucking crazy, dude. So the, (laughs) the great minds of the North retire to Lord Hoster's audience chamber. Ed Muir continues to talk of his victory at Stone Mill until Brendan angrily cuts him off. It's like, yeah, so, you know, I just I beat Tyrell Lannister at Stone Mill. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard about that, but yeah, I, I beat him. You know, he was trying to cross over and I just beat him. I beat him. Brendan angrily cuts him off. Rob had wanted Tywin to come west. He had meant to lead Tywin's army, composed mostly of foot, on a chase through the Westerlands, and then meet him on ground of his own choosing. If Tywin fought, he would have been bloodied. If not, he would have been trapped in the west while Stannis attacked King's Landing. If Stannis had won, Rob might have been able to forge a peace. Instead, riders from Bitterbridge were able to meet with Tywin, just in time for him to link up with Lord Mathis and Lord Randall, and then march to meet Lord Mace and take Stannis in the rear. Catelyn says that Rob must now win back the North. Rob does not see how he can unless he wins back Lord Walder. So shit is fucked up right now. Listen, we've gone in depth about the War of the Five Kings and Stannis thought he was making a bold move. Edmure thought he was making a bold move. Each thought it would help themselves in the war. Mm -hmm. And it ends up just helping Tywin. Totally by chance. Stannis thought he would gain all these houses to his cause. And he did. But not the ones that fucking matter. They actually shun him and it turns them into the Lannisters camp. That's why he loses at King's Landing. That plus the timing of everything. Patriots of, of Westeros. You know, timing got lucky, but... Always has a rabbit's foot up his ass. Yes, but at the same time, if you look at Rob, Edmure, Tywin, Stannis, Renly, which of these things is not like the other? It's Tywin. Tywin's the only one that's not fucking goofing around here. You know what I mean? Like, Tywin's just, he's all about business. He's not fucking around. Stannis is trying to is trying to like use dark magic to make more houses come to his cause. Yeah, there 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 is a little sense of desperation with Stannis. Yes. Because Ed- he knows he has the lack of men. He needs something. Whereas Rob and Edmure, listen, that's that's a great idea by Rob. Rob wanted Tywin to come west. Okay. You and I have, have talked about this before, and I I think we feel a little bit differently about it. You you put the blame more on Edmure, which is easy to do, because he is an idiot. He is. But the lack of communication here by Rob is what I put the blame on. If Rob wanted Tywin to come west, he should have gotten together with Edmure and said, you're the Lord of River Run. It's my plan for Tywin to cross your lands, cross your river, and move west. And they may attack River Run. They may try to put River Run in siege. Hold out, because I want him to move west. But he doesn't communicate that. He either assumed that Edmure wouldn't be able to stop Tywin, or Edmure would just be like drinking and whoring and not give a shit that Lannister forces were crossing over his lands. Now, if he didn't trust Edmure enough to share this plan with him, leave the Blackfish there. Like, leave somebody else in charge that you do trust. I mean, what do you expect, bro? You got Edmure and Catelyn there and no other leadership whatsoever. Everybody's with you. So what do you, like, what do you think's going to go on when you're gone? You're going to lose Jaime. You're going to lose the war. This chapter just proves to me that Rob is not any sort of king. 
There's good intentions. Well, it, well, it also proves, I think, too, and I was just going to say a couple of and you, you have always said it. Although, like, the Blackfish was kind of like acting hand. Right. He really needed to make it an, an official hand. He, he did, yeah. And he needed to leave that person in charge at Riveron. Not just that, but that person needed to know what his plan was. Now, the only excuse that I could give Rob is he didn't have this plan when he went west. And maybe he meant to send Edmure a raven, and maybe he got injured storming the crag and just didn't get a chance to. But it's, I want to say it's a rookie mistake, but it's not, it's a little bit worse than a rookie mistake. It's a, I'll, I'll say it's a rookie mistake because he's in a situation where you know, you're crowned king. You don't expect it to be in the middle of a war that you're crowned king and you're given this kingdom. And now you're not just thinking about justice for, you know, it starts off where Rob marches to save his father and then it's justice for his father. And now it's, what even is it? What is he fighting this war for? Just to kill Joffrey? The reason for Rob to be in this war and Rickard Karstark to be in this war at this point. You know, when it begins, it's all about Ned. It's all good because Ned is a person, the Warden of the North, Mm -hmm. your overlord, you can rally behind him. The Riverlands can rally behind him because Catelyn is the lady of River Run or was at some point and the houses of the Riverlands will rally around her because she is fighting for her husband. Everybody in the Riverlands and the North can all rally around Ned. But once Ned's out of the picture, you're already at war. So a good reason to keep fighting is justice for Ned. But as you quickly see... There's no justice to be had. In reality, there was no chance of them ever arriving at King's Landing, putting it under sea. It's just, it's not going to happen. It's not ever going to happen. It wouldn't matter even if they had all of the power of the Vale in addition to theirs. There is no chance of them putting King's Landing under siege and taking it. Because of King's Landing's location, mostly because of the houses of the South. Mm Mm-hmm. And let's also not forget, too, when you're, when you're attacking a castle like King's Landing with the heavy defenses, even if you're able to get inside the city in itself, the good old-fashioned Obi-Wan Kenobi line from Revenge of the Sith, it's over. I have the high ground. They have the high ground. They have, they have the... You need a, a whole lot more men than even probably normal to, to attack a, a castle like King's Landing. I'm saying it can't be done, but it can be done. It can be done, but it can't be done by Rob. And it can't be done by the Great John. And it can't be done by a kingdom that was just put together overnight. It just can't be done. Because the reason for it, the cost, it's not worth Ned. It is to Rob. Maybe it is to the Tullys. Maybe it is to the Car Starks at first or the Umbers. Because the Umbers are good Stark men. Mm -hmm. But when you get closer to King's Landing, when you're you know, when the Lannisters are making deals with the Tyrells and the Tarleys and the Red Wines, it's not worth it because you're going to lose so much. And for what? And Ned wouldn't even want that anyway. So why are they at war now? And now with these decisions, it's not a war. Now it's survival. You know, it's like if you, you've you played chess before, right? Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. About it. All right. Oh. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of remember you pretty bad at it. I'm sorry. But all right. Well, the best way I could put it is I was playing a game against, uh, I think it was, I think it was against Jim Lech Hagnina. Yeah, I love you. Yeah. Like bloodbath. Oh, no, no. You know, it, no. I was playing a game against Rich and Jim was helping him. And this is, I was playing chess like every day back then. I made a move and then I saw, I saw that if Rich made two moves, I would be in checkmate. It was a blunder on my part and I saw the mistake that I made. But Rich didn't notice it. And Jim was a little bit better. He didn't notice it, but he kind of was getting a feel for what moves he needed to make to to get me. So I went from like being on the offensive and like having a game plan to win to seeing that I made a blunder and making not quite panicked moves because I could see the problem that was coming. I could see the trouble I was in, but I had to hustle and I had my, you know, my main focus was safety and preserving just not not losing not getting killed and that's kind of where rob is at this point in time stressful and i feel bad for him because it's not just the north like catlin says we got to go back to north but it's like yeah okay but what about what about the fucking riverlands who also declared me king you know we leave we break this whole thing up they're fucked and then we're fucked we're all fucked 
So they got to be very, very careful. And it doesn't seem like there's anything that could have been done at this point in time. There's nothing that could have been done to for them to win this war. I don't think there's anything that could have been done for them to avoid nearly complete destruction. Catlin 3. Catlin stands to Rob's left as the bodies are brought in. Edmure stands to his right. All the bannermen are there, including Sir Reynold and Sir Rolf, but not the Queen. The bodies are Tion Frey and Willem Lannister. Rob orders the small John to have his father bring in the prisoners. The great John leads in five men. Two more died in the taking, and an eighth is mortally wounded. The prisoners killed two guards as well, Delp and Elwood. Their leader is Lord Rickard. Rob confronts him angrily, and Lord Rickard mocks his king. He is angered that Rob did nothing to Catelyn for freeing Jamie. Understandable. Sir Brendan comes in. Rob tells the great John to hang the other seven, even the dead ones, and keep Lord Rickard until he is done conferring privately with Brendan. He adjourns with Brendan, Edmure, and Catelyn. Brendan tells him that the Karstark men, 300 horse, are all gone. They snuck away in twos and threes during the night. Lord Rickard has offered his daughter's hand in marriage to any man who brings him Jamie's head. Edmure says they must keep the murders a secret, but it is too late for that. Rob says he must execute Lord Rickard as a traitor. This is a Ned move. This is a Ned move. Uh, uh, let's finish, then we'll, we'll discuss. There's some stuff to discuss here. The next morning, Lord Rickard is brought to the Goswood. Rob takes the axe from Long Lou and does the deed himself. Before he dies, Lord Rickard says Rob will be accursed as a kin slayer, as House Karstark was founded a thousand years ago by Carlin Stark, who was granted lands after helping put down a rebel lord and built Carlshold. 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 Whatever the fuck. Now known as Carhold. Catelyn retreats to Lord Hoster's Solar afterwards to be with her father. Maester Vyman tells her it will not be long now. Jane comes in later. She does not know how to comfort Rob. Catelyn tells her to wait patiently and be there when Rob needs her, which he always will eventually. Catelyn tells her she must make an heir soon. Like real soon, as things work out. Jane agrees and says that Lady Sybil gives her a concoction of herbs, milk, and ale every morning to make her fertile. She thinks she will be with child soon. Okay, first off, red flag. Catelyn goes from... I know what Tansy is. Not knowing what Tansy is, and now, like, yo, my mom gives me a concoction of herbs, milk, and ale every morning to make me fertile. Okay, yeah, they are from the Westerlands, and yeah, Lady Sybil is... Dude, it's like, girl, I think you're young enough. I don't think you need anything else to make you fertile. <laughs> like, you just hit puberty. What do you, why do you need herbs, milk, and ale to make you fertile? That sounds a little bit fishy, but Catelyn's, you know, just like, yeah, all right, that's cool, whatever. That being said... Even though Catelyn probably should have noticed the red flag, I didn't personally notice the red flag. I don't think anyone does at first, man. I, I didn't. Like, I didn't realize how crap that you know, she's. Which is odd. It makes the whole Catelyn character more odd than before because she makes note that Ghost isn't around when she's introduced to the Westerlings. Greywind. Uh, Greywind, my bad. She makes note that Greywind's not around. She asks why. Rob says, well, Jane's uncomfortable around him, but also. He's always growling at Sir Rolf Spicer. And Catelyn says, send Sir Rolf away. The direwolves were sent here to protect you, and there must be something wrong with Sir Rolf. So she's already, she's got Sir Rolf Spicer on her radar. Surely she must be looking at the Westerlings in a certain way, mm -hmm. just because of the whole Grey Wind thing. So now Jane's telling her that her mom gives her a concoction of herbs, milk, and ale, something Catelyn, there's no way she's ever heard of, to make her fertile, and it's, like you said, it's not like she's in her 30s, you know, she's like a young yeah. fucking girl, it's like she's as fertile as possible, so she's drinking herbs, milk, and ale every morning to make her fertile. We're looking closely at it right now, we're looking closely at Catelyn, so it doesn't seem to make sense, I don't think that George is writing it this way on purpose, I mean, for his story's sake, yeah, but he's not thinking about, like, alright, well, Catelyn noticed that Grey Wind growls at Sir Rolf, the red flag's raised, she's hearing about this concoction to make Jane fertile. I don't think he's writing it on purpose for Catelyn's character arc, for Catelyn's character, that she doesn't see another red flag with this concoction. I think he's thinking more about the end result of this whole narrative. And it's fine. It's not like it doesn't work. It may be nitpicking, but it does make Catelyn seem like crazy. Like she can't focus on things she should be focusing on 
But there are times when she's really smart. Like, she is really smart sometimes. But other times, she's either totally selfish or just totally missing the point. And what would she have done anyway? It's not like the Westerling betrayal, like the Lady Sybil and, and Rolf Spicer betrayal. It's not like that was the nail in the coffin. The nail was already in the coffin. Now it's all just a matter of twisting it in there. Yeah. All right, so Tion Frey, Willem Lannister, Rickard Karstark. Obviously, he didn't do the right thing, but do we understand why Lord Rickard Karstark did what he did? Yeah, he just wants blood. He just wants justice. He just wants to kill anyone, just any kind of blood. Consumed by vengeance. Yeah. Sith. It's like a Sith. Yeah. And your anger. It seems you killed her. Oh, I killed her. No. Yes. Fine. It's not that great of a meme, but it was on uh, prequel memes. Just like Happy Mother's Day that had fucking Padme dying. Right <laughs> 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 to Luke and Leia. <laughs> Let's look at Le- Rickard Karstark for a minute because he's right. The Karstarks, they share blood with the Starks a thousand years ago. And maybe their DNA is not as close as it once was, but Karstarks, Starks are considered, if not from the same branch, definitely from the same tree. So that being said, if he's pissed at Rob and Catelyn, fine. But his behavior is nearly as bad as theirs is. Maybe worse because he's a grown-ass man. And he's the lord of a great house. And he's been the lord of a great house for a long time. And he knew Ned. So he's doing like this shit like killing kids because he's pissed off at Rob, who's a kid. And Catelyn, who's... A kid. A kid, like a mind of a kid or a sociopath or a psycho or whatever she is. He knows his only. He knows what he's going. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. He knows it's going to probably lead in to at least banishment, if not death. And he doesn't care. Yeah. He's he's lost his mind. Yeah. Is what it is. I understand that losing your two sons, it's the future of your house. And he's got the daughters, and he promises his daughter's hand to anybody that can bring him Jamie. And even if he got Jamie and was able to torture Jamie and kill Jamie slowly, that wouldn't make him happy. You know, I'm sure he'd feel like vengeance had been served, his son's souls can rest, yada, 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 but they'd still have the same problems. It's a shame for Rob that these are the guys he's surrounded with. Mm -hmm. They can only think so far until the pride gets in the way of the bigger picture. Right. But the same argument can be made about Rob and Catelyn. Like, none of them can really think that far ahead. They think just far enough, but not far enough where... They're able to win this war or come away with, you know, an advantage over the Lannisters. So the decision to execute Lord Rickard, it is a Ned move because he does it himself. Rickard's argument is that Rob is kind of siding with the Lannisters over the Karstarks. Right. I know we talked about it when we talked about Rob Stark almost two years ago now, but is this the right move to behead Rickard Karstark? It's almost like he's putting himself in such a spot that no move is the right move. Yeah. Any movie he does is going to be looked upon like, wow, uh, he had to do that. He had to show some, you know, he had to show some strength there and kill him. Yeah. Karstark was acting out of control. He doesn't do it all of a sudden. It's like, nah, he's weak. He allows this kind of stuff. Well, you know, he says he's, Rickard betrayed, and if he's going to have any kind of honor, he has to behead Rickard Karstark. And he, he makes it about honor. But I would wager that in the back of Rob's mind, he is really doing the math, crunching the numbers, taking a look at the lay of the land, and I think he feels he's not going to beat the Lannisters, and if he doesn't behead Rickard Karstark, Tywin's going to be less likely to be merciful. Do you think he's thinking that far? Yeah. He's thinking if Tywin sees the death of Leo, what what was his name again? It was Tion Frey and Willem Tion Lannister. Frey and yeah. Willem Lannister, there you go. They don't clear the other, the spy guy. Tywin then might take it out and kill like Sansa or something. Well, right. He well, he in his eyes he's doing this. He's doing this. Hey, listen. Yeah, this happened. Didn't want to happen. I took care of it. I didn't authorize this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like, look, I'm sorry. This guy, this guy, Rickard Karstark, he killed the kids. He killed the uh, you know little master teenager, Tion Frey. It was wrong, and I killed him. All right. If you're Tywin. What else can you ask for? You're not supposed to kill your noble hostages, but if you do, the guy that killed him is killed. I think Tywin 
not that he'd be forgiving about it. Like they're still at war, but at least it's like, all right, yeah, you did the right thing. I guess if that's the right thing, who knows? What about Edmure's suggestion to keep him in a dungeon? <laughs> well, Starks and keeping people in a dungeon hasn't really worked out well for them. All right, so he lost the phrase and he's losing the car starts. Anyone else? Yeah, right. <laughs> what else can we do here? <laughs> he's not even thinking about the Boltons. <laughs> nah, Bruce? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He's my most. He's my most. He's a cop. He's he's doing nothing. He's he's doing good. Bruce Bolton is probably getting word of everything that's happening and just like, all right, this is this is great for me. <laughs> this is even easier than I thought. Yeah, the more times I read this stuff, bro, the more times I go over this story. As much as Bruce Bolton is a heel, Walter Frey is a heel, I don't blame them. I understand why they did what they did. And you know what? If I was in their spot, I don't know that I would have done differently. I like to think I wouldn't have done the Red Wedding itself. We figured out a different way to take care of everything. But mm -hmm. the betrayal, like, you're doomed. This is a sinking ship. Get out while you can. This is the Titanic. Dude, they went within four chapters. This is the fourth chapter since the last Catelyn chapter of Clash of Kings. In four chapters, they've gone from treating with King Renly, mm -hmm. making deals about a post-war Westeros, to now the wheels are just completely off, you know? All right, now we jump all the way to chapter 36 from chapter 21. Finally, mercifully, the guy who's been dying for like three <laughs> books is finally dead. <laughs> John, have you ever seen someone dying for so long in a book or a movie or fucking? Usually, like a guy like like guy like this is just like a band aid right off. Yeah, been dying the whole time. Not even like, I, I think he was a little bit with it uh, in, in a Game of Thrones when when they took River Run back when Rob saved River Run, but since then he's just been like a fucking zombie in pain. Finally, Lord Hoster has died. Catelyn watches as he's prepared for his final send off. He's placed in a boat flying his colors with his shield, his hunting horn, his helm, surrounded by driftwood and kindling. Seven are chosen to push the boat into the river to honor seven. the seven faces of God. Rob, Lord Jonas Bracken, Lord Titus Blackwood, Lord Carol Vance, Lord Jason Malister, Sir Mark Piper, and Lord Walder Frey's steward for the past 12 years, lame Lothar Frey who has just arrived with a Frey contingent led by Walder Rivers. And this is Lord Walder's eldest bastard. And knowing where this goes, red flag. He sends the cripple and the bastard to treat with you. Mm -hmm. And the symbolism of sending a cripple and the bastard as envoys is not lost on anybody. But Rob greeted them gracefully and quietly asked Sir Desmond to step aside so that Lothar could join the funeral detail. Sir Brendan, standing next to Catelyn, tells Lord Edmure... It is time. Edmure launches a flaming arrow at the boat, but misses. He tries twice more before finally handing the boat to Brynden in frustration, who successfully sets the boat alight. Brynden escorts Catelyn to Rob and Jane. Rob embraces her, then begins receiving condolences from his lords, including Lord Jason, the Great John, and Sir Rolf. Lothar comes up and asks for an audience that evening, which Rob grants. Rob tells Catelyn to walk with him. A lot of bad news has been coming in recently. <laughs> Let's put it mildly. <laughs> right. Luck is about to change. It has to change, right? <laughs> Rob has learned of the defeat at Duskendale and also that Robert Glover was captured soon after the battle. He plans to exchange Martin Lannister for him. Now Rob has to tell Catelyn that Sansa has been married to Tyrion Lannister. Catelyn says it is time to bend the knee to the Lannisters, but Rob says he will never make peace with those who killed his father. Catelyn takes her leave. Okay, why is Catelyn saying it is now time to bend the knee to the Lannisters? And let me preface by saying, when we talked about the last chapter, talking about Catelyn, sometimes she's with it, she's smart, most times she's just thinking about herself, and sometimes she just seems like a fucking crazy woman. This is one example, I think, of her being able to think ahead and being pretty wise to what's going on. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think this is her being a coward? I'm, I'm trying to come up with a word. I think it's funny, you know, <laughs> after all they've just been through, now it's like, all right, it's time to bend the knee. Oh, oh now that you let Jamie go. We're done. <laughs> now that you let Jamie go, it's time to bend the knee. Is that what you're saying, Mom? We're, we're done. All right, I'm out. It was fun. I'm, I'm going to go back to, uh, well, I can't go to Winterfell. I don't know where I'm going to go. 
Catelyn's thinking, all right, so Sansa's been married to Tyrion. She's got to know what Tywin's thinking with this marriage. Yeah, but then she also has to, if she knows that, then she also has to know they can't bend the knee now. They're, they're going to be wiped out. So she's thinking ahead, but she also has to realize that his plan is to fucking wipe all you guys out. His plan is to have Sansa in the north with, Ty- with Tyrion. That's his plan. Plain as day. He's married Sansa. So you really can't bend the knee because he's not interested in that. Now he wants Winterfell. If he's seen how much you guys have fucked up, he's taking you off the board all the way. And that's what I mean. Like, Catelyn can see that. Think about it. He can't bend the knee. If Rob's saying he'll never make peace with the Lannisters, like, yeah, okay, but it's not about that. Like, you can't make peace with the Lannisters because they don't want to make peace with us. They just want to kill you. Mm-hmm. Especially you. Especially Rob. Hours later, Rollum comes to summon her to dinner. And the audience with Lothar. You know what, dude? I'm not implying that Catelyn knows this, but I think in a perfect world for, for Tywin Lannister, Rob's dead. Bren and Rickon are thought to be dead. Arya's missing in action. I think Catelyn's safe. I think Catelyn's more valuable to Tywin as a hostage. And we see that in the Red mm-hmm. Wedding, the aftermath. Let me, let me also point that real quick before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's funny. Catelyn warned Rob about if they lose, they lose everything. Mm-hmm. Remember what Tywin did to the Targaryen babes? And now you just fast forward to here. It's like, you have lost everything. You did, yeah. That's not going to change. Yeah, yeah, it's... And she also said the only way to beat, we have to beat him on the field. And they did. Mm-hmm. Every single time they went on the field, they beat him. But they have lost everything. Catelyn has to know that Tywin wants to kill Rob. And if Rob has an heir, kill that heir. She, I think, is smart enough to realize that she may be safe. You know, because she's a good hostage to keep the Riverlands at bay, for the most part. So when she says it's time to bend the knee to the Lannisters, is she saying that knowing she's that... Saying it- the north of the knee, or for her, really, to bend the knee. Right. Exactly. Well, or just, like, it's time to bend the knee. Like, she has to know that Rob would be killed, and she would be a hostage. So, what is she really saying there? Is that what she's saying? Is she saying it's time to bend the knee, thinking Rob wouldn't realize that he'll never get to bend the knee? Hours later, Rollin comes to summon her to dinner with the audience, and the audience with Lothar Frey. Rob, Edmure, and Walder are there as well. After dinner, Lothar begins by reporting that Winterfell has burned. Big Walder and Little Walder, who Catelyn, she's fostering them at Winterfell, even though she's Mm -hmm. probably never seen them and never will. Big Walder and Little Walder have sent a letter stating that a battle was fought and Theon put the castle to the torch when hope was lost and most of the people to the sword. Most of the women and children survived and were taken by Ramsay Snow to the Dread Fort. Lothar says that Walder will accept a new marriage alliance if Rob comes to the twins and apologizes personally for his actions. Rob accepts. Lothar says that in that case, Edmure must marry Walder's youngest daughter, Roslyn, the child of his mm-hmm. sixth mm-hmm. wife, Bethany Rosby. Edmure is furious that he must marry a woman he has never seen, but Walder says that there will be no alliance if these terms are not met. Rob dismisses the phrase. Edmure tries to refuse, but the others tell him winning back the phrase is essential. And he grudgingly relents. Red flags all over the place. Right. I definitely one in particular. It, it, it just seems like that's it. Like there's no end. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, yeah. Edmure has to take up the torch now. There wasn't anything like, all right, now you, now you have to give us this and that. And it seems a little too simple in actuality. Well, it's the phrase took a chance on them when they were in a much better position. And the king, well, he wasn't the king at the moment, he wasn't declared king, but the future warden of the north, I guess it depends on your point of view, but it's it seems like it's more prestigious to marry your daughter to the warden of the north than the lord of River Run. Although, it probably close to both two of the great houses. But when things were looking up for House Stark and House Tully, the phrase had this one alliance to marry Rob Stark. Now things are looking like complete shit for them. And they get to marry Edmure. Not only that, they, they seek to marry Edmure. The way Catelyn realized what's going on with the Tyrion Sansa wedding, she should have realized what's going on here. And maybe it's easy for us to say so because we know how this ends. But you say Theon burnt Winterfell, put the people to the sword, killed Bran and Rickon. If you said Balon Greyjoy did that, you believe it. But for Theon to do that, You've known the kid for years. 
Theon's not going to do that. He's not going to kill Bran and Rickon. And he's an asshole, and he betrayed you, but he's not going to kill his foster brothers. But if you want to believe that he did, okay. Then you're going to say that Ramsay Snow saved the women and children and took them to the Dread Fort. You had somebody there. You got like the whole fucking North there. Somebody has to have heard some rumors about Ramsay Snow. At least some rumors. Right. That's not a red flag. Okay, how about the Dread Fort? How about just the fact that House Bolton's sigil is a flayed man? That in the Age of Heroes, the Boltons wore the flesh of the Starks. How about that? Not a red flag? Okay, fine. And you're going to say that the cripple and the bastard Frey, that's them being there working at this deal. That's not a red flag. Okay. And you say Rob has to come to the twins and apologize, apologize personally for your actions. That right there, I don't know, man. That's like... Shut up. Demanding an apology personally for your actions. It's a setup. It's a setup. That's not how shit works. But Rob accepts. And then Edmure gets all bent out of shape about thinking he should have his pick of phrase like Rob did. I feel like Edmure is the only one with a brain in this in that scene. Yeah, sure you want to do this? Uh, Edmure. Catlin 5. Rob sets out for the twins in a light drizzle with a party including Catlin, Edmure, and Lothar. Jane rides to join the party and begs to be taken along, but Rob sends her back to River Run. It was Catelyn's idea to leave her behind, as her presence could lead to great difficulty. Sir Reynald is the only Westerling with the group. The others remain at River Run, save Sir Rolf, who was dispatched to Duskendale as soon as Lord Tywin consented to trade Robert Glover for Martin Lannister. They are protected by Sir Brynden, whom Rob has named to the new title Warden of the Southern Marshes. With Sir Rolf gone Grey Wind. <laughs> like the most confusing title ever given to anyone. We're, we're giving titles out now. Just making shit up. With Sir Rolf gone, Grey Wind is at Rob's side once more. Galbart Glover commands the outriders of Rob's army in Brynden's absence, while the Great John leads the van. Sir Wendell guards the baggage, and Robin leads the rear guard. Uh, Robin Flint, right? The army is 3,500 strong and consists almost entirely of Northmen. The lords of the Riverlands are staying behind to defend their lands while Rob retakes the north. Not really much of a plan, to be honest with you. Lady Mage and Daisy speak to Catelyn about the upcoming fight with confidence, but Catelyn is not so sure. Edmure spends most of his time with his friends and companions, including Sir Mark, Patrick, and Lord Lyman Goodbrook. The rain gets worse. Galbar reports that the bridge at Fairmarket has washed away. They will have to take the high road through Seven Streams and Hagsmire. Eight days later, they reach Old Stones. Rob asks Catelyn about the history of the place, which is mentioned in a song about Jenny of Old Stones. Catelyn remembers that one time she camped there as a girl when she pretended to be Jenny and Peter was her prince of dragonflies. Oh, God. These fucking, those two deserve each other. They should have just, she should have just married Peter and saved the whole realm a lot of trouble. She explains that Old Stones was the castle of Christopher Four Mud, a king of the First Men, who once ruled from the neck to the trident. Which really isn't. It's really not that much land. He was known as the Hammer of Justice, and he won 99 battles against Andal invaders, but he was defeated and killed in his 100th battle, when seven Andal kings joined against him. His successor, Christopher V, was not his equal, and the kingdom was lost, and House Mud, which had ruled for a thousand years, was ended. Rob and Catelyn next talk of the succession. Bran and Rick and gone. Rob needs, and I know you're going to have something to say about this, Rob needs to name an heir to serve in that capacity until Jane gives him a son. Catelyn knows who the fuck he's talking about. But she says that Lord Rickard had no siblings, but his father had a sister who married a younger son of Lord Raymar Royce of the junior branch. He's like, seriously? She's desperate. She's desperate. She had three daughters who married a Wainwood, a Corbray, and a Templeton. Rob silences his mother and states he wants to legitimize John. Release him from the watch and designate him heir. Catelyn thinks this is a bad idea, <laughs> fearing that he would harm Rob's own issue to secure his position. Okay. Meanwhile, you're marching to the twins to apologize to Walter Frey, but let's worry yeah. about John's kids. She points out that Aegon IV legitimized his bastards on his deathbed, leading to five generations of Blackfire pretenders before Sir Barristan and Selmy slew the last in the Stepstones. Rob is angry at his mother's lack of support and stalks off. Yeah, I would be like, fuck off, Catelyn. Yeah. You notice anything 
John is more of a Stark than uh, than we are. He wouldn't yeah. do that. He's more of Eddard than anyone. But what the fuck is the problem with Catelyn, where even now, at this moment... Exactly. She, that, that's how I was just going to say it. It's not like we're talking about shit down the line. Like, they're in a situation where Rob could very well end up dead. And they both know it. They're not really talking about it, but they both know it. And she's willing, if that happens, she's willing to rest everything on Lord Rickard's father's sister's son, who married... You are my father's brother's cousin's aunt's niece's former roommate. <laughs> what does that make us? You and know, that's okay. what she's willing to put her, her... her. It's not just the Starks. Like, you could say, like, oh, she don't really give a shit about the Starks. And yeah, sometimes it doesn't seem like she gives a shit about the Starks, but it's also... He's the king of the North and the Riverlands. You're betting everything now just because you're jealous of John's mom, not even knowing the story. You'd rather put everything on some fucking kid. You don't even know if they exist. You're just, you're just making shit up. Psychotic. Have no fear for a woman scorned. And Rob is angry at his mother's lack of support stalks off. Good for Rob. The rain does not let up. The progress slows to a crawl in Hagsmire. Lord Jason catches up to the column there, he brings with him the captain of the Miraham. And the Miraham is a trading ship of some sort, but this captain reports that Balon Greyjoy is dead. What's more, his brother Euron returned to Pike the very day Balon died and claimed the Sea Stone Chair. And you know I love this shit. I fucking love all his Ironborn shit. But I think this news, I feel like Rob loves it even more. And it gives them that that last little jolt of confidence mm-hmm. to get through the rain, to get through the weather, and get to the twins. When Lord Botley objected to Euron's claim, Euron had him drowned in a cask of seawater. Rob sees the opportunity here. He realizes that Victarion Greyjoy and Asha Greyjoy must return to Pike to contest Euron's hold on the throne, and that they will take most of their ships and captains with them, weakening the defenses at Moke Caitlin. Rob tells Lord Jason to prepare two ships to return to the north. Galbart will be on one, and Lady Mage on the other, and they will make for Greywater Watch to inform the most famous character we've never met, Lord Howland Reed, of the plan. Not that we know what the plan is, but they're going to inform Lord Howland Reed of the plan. After the wedding, Rob will divide his army into three groups, one led by himself, one led by the Great John, and one led by Lord Roos, who, again, hasn't seen him in a while, but it's just assumed that he's, you know, assume he's good to go. While the Great John leads an attack up the causeway, Rob Battle will bypass Moat Kaelin with Howland Reed's help and fall on the castle from the rear. He also informs Catelyn that she will wait out the rest of the war at Seaguard. Bitch. Finally, he has his lords witness his royal decree naming his heir, presumably, presumably, John. So, John, a couple things. First off, I know we discussed this before, but let's just touch on it again. We don't know for sure that he names John. All signs point to him naming John. Did he name John? Will this decree come into play with John becoming king in the north in the Winds of Winter? Does it happen differently than it did in Game of Thrones? I think it will. I mean, there, there's a rumor, there's a theory that it's actually, he actually doesn't name John, but he names Catelyn as the heir. Oh, I've heard, yeah. Which just makes... He, I, I think you makes, told me that theory. Like, Did I read about that theory? It's a retarded theory, by the way. Like, Why? Mm-hmm. It has to be with John. Where it's being sent is is is, is the trick. Is the trap. He didn't send it with. What do you mean? Where he says it's it's going, he had think two people go. It's not really there. It's someplace else. And he knew at this time he he couldn't trust people. Refresh my memory. Did he send one royal decree with each of them? I believe that's what he did. I thought he sent one with each of them to better the chances of it reaching its destination. Mm-hmm. But essentially, they're both sailing for Greywater Watch. They're both sailing for Lord Howland Reed. If Howland Reed gets this, like, oh, he's sort of legitimizing him to be there, you know, oh, he doesn't have to be. He can do it himself. I mean, John. Because, you know, Howland Reed just. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, whoa. Well, funny thing here, actually. <laughs> Bit of a clerical error. But. <laughs> All in due time, I make my appearance. I mean, what we know of Howland Reed, I, I would assume that he'd continue the, the ruse for, for Ned's sake, even though Ned's dead. I always thought we were going to see him somehow in the books. Yeah, I think yeah. we have to at this point. You know what? He may have a big part to play in John becoming the king in the north in the Winds of Winter because they just declare him the king in the north based on his performance, the Battle of the Bastards, and 
getting vengeance for the North, vengeance for the Red Wedding. It's not that simple, especially because in the Winds of Winter version of the Battle of the Bastards, it's not really going to be a Battle of the Bastards. It's going to be the Stannis battle. Mm -hmm. I really like your idea on this, that Stannis is in trouble and Jon takes the place of... The Vale. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to get too deep into it, replacing plot points and how it works for the book based on what happens in the show. I will just say that I would think at least one of these royal decrees reaches Helen Reed and when John comes back from his death, he's named king and he's legitimized. I think that is how it happens in the books. And I think that's when we'll see Helen Reed, although I could be wrong. And you know, a lot has been made of this plan. And before season six of Game of Thrones, I didn't even see John becoming the king in the North. I thought the king of Westeros was how George would angle it for him. I didn't think King of the North was a step towards that if he does indeed become King of the Seven Kingdoms. But it's a, a fairly huge plot point here in the end game. We're going to have Catelyn's uncles, brothers, yeah. cousins, three times removed as the heir. Bring the royal decree to Helen Reed. Have him find my grandfather's sisters, sons, cousins, nephews, brother in laws. Tell him he's the king. And tell him to send more men. Catelyn six. Rob's host approaches the twins, and there is a fantastic image. I think it's in one of my Song of Ice and Fire art books uh, from Fantasy Flight. I don't know if I ever showed them to you. Artwork of Song of Ice and Fire, Volume 1 and 2, and they were, yeah. they were both published before Game of Thrones started airing. But there is this one image, and I, I, I fucking love it. And it's Rob's host approaching the twins in the rain, looking quite defeated. Rob rides at the head with Catelyn, Edmure, and Sir Reynold. Four Freys ride to meet them, Sir Ryman and his sons, Edwin, Blackwalder, and Peter. So Sir Ryman is now the heir to the twins. Edwin is his oldest son, Blackwalder is second, and then Peter. When they come near, Greywind begins to growl and leaps forward, causing Peter's mount to throw him. Freys are cool and barely polite as they lead Rob towards the twins. Red flag. At the portcullis, <laughs> Greywind starts howling and refuses to continue. Red flag. Walder and Lothar come up and say he must fear the water and offer to give him over to the Master of Hounds. Rob has Sir Reynald stay with him instead. And Sir Reynald, hopefully we'll get to touch him, him with the Red Wedding. Sir Reynald is Jane Westerling's brother, and uh, mm -hmm. he's not in on the betrayal. He's the Knight of Seashells, just a little minor character. And it's these little minor characters that I love, that George Martin is able to give so much life to in just a few sentences. Sir Reynald stays with Greywind. Rob enters the Great Hall, where Walder... And Joyous, I guess that's his wife. Oh, wait. Aegon sits at the base of the high seat. Aegon Frey is a half-wit wearing a fool's crown and is obviously meant as a slight since he is usually kept hidden. Red flag. Other Freys fill up the rest of the hall. Walder greets them with little courtesy and sends Sir Benfrey to fetch Roslyn. Rob apologizes for his slight and Walder says that he should apologize to his eligible daughters, granddaughters, and great-granddaughters instead. He calls them all forward. Arwen, Sheree, Amare, a widow who had been married to Sir Pate of Seven Streams that was killed by Gregor Clegane, Marianne, Cersei, Fairwalder, Marianne, Taita, Alex, Marissa, and the twins, Sarah and Sarah. Another Walda comes forward as well, but she is the daughter of Walder Rivers, and he only wants trueborn issues up front. Rob apologizes to the assembled women. Sir Benfrey then brings Rosalind forward. Rob is about to leave to see his men, when Catelyn suddenly remembers to ask for bread and salt to secure guest right. Rob's men, including Edmure, the Great John, and Sir Mark, thank Walder for his hospitality, and Catelyn feels they are now safe. That's such a fucking weird thing to feel good about, right? The law of guest right. We got some bread and salt here, we're good. He's not going to kill us, he gives us bread. Uh, it's true, he did give us bread, alright. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Catelyn and Edmure inspect the bridal suite while Rob leads his army across the bridges. Edmure is suspicious about his bride, wondering if she might be barren. <laughs> well, Catelyn expresses surprise at how smoothly things are going. Yeah, red flag. Catelyn returns to her room to change and then goes in search of Freys. She comes across a group in the Great Hall consisting of Lothar, Sir Raymond, Lythine Frey's husband, Lord Lucius Viperin, and his sons, Sir Damon, Sir Hostine, Sir Hasin, I kind of like. And Sir Leslie, whatever the fuck. And his sons, 
Sir Harry said, Sir Dirty, there's so many fucking phrases. This is so crazy. There's just too many, though. It's just, it's just yeah. You just, it's you do a podcast just on phrase. I mean, I, I like it. I like the idea of it. But she asks after Sir Perwin and learns he is away. She then asks to be directed to the maester. She asks Maester Brennett if Roslyn is barren and receives assurances that she is fertile and that her mother, Bethany Rosby, gave Lord Walder a child a year of which five lived past infancy. Sir Perwin, Sir Benfrey, Maester Williman, who took his vows the year before and now serves Lord Eon Hunter. And the hunters are in the Vale, Olivar and Roslyn. Catelyn next goes to see Rob. She's just fucking walking around, poking her nose, all sorts of fucking business here. <laughs> Catelyn next goes to see Rob, who is closeted with Sir Wendell, Robin Flint, the Great John, the Small John, and Lord Roos. Catching up with Lord Roos. Oh, where have you been, Roos? What's been going on, guys? I don't say. <laughs> Lord Roos has brought word of Lannisters on the Trident. The wolves are closing in, bud. Sir Willis has been captured. He also reveals the deaths of Leobald and Clay Serwin, blaming the deaths on Theon as well. Just blame it all on Theon. Theon and what? The fucking eight guys that he had. Ramsay has vowed to cleanse the north of Iron Man. Red flag. He also sent Roos a sample of Theon's skin. Red flag. Rob wants Theon dead, but Roos opines that he is more useful alive and that they might extract concessions from the Iron Men in exchange for his execution since... Theon has the best claim to the Seastone Chair. Rob reluctantly agrees. Kind of a dark decision for Rob. Not very Ned like. You know, he just he's just, you know, he it, it, he's his brain just like mush right now. Well, I think it's that, but what else is kind of interesting is that if you recall in the Game of Thrones, in the Bran chapter, when Rob is talking about when he called the banners and he was telling Bran how nervous he was acting as the Lord with all, all these northern lords looking at him for leadership or expecting him to fail or however he felt. But when he spoke about Lord Roos, he said all he could think about was those rooms they have at the Dreadfort where they flay their enemies and basically expressed a feeling of intimidation that he gets from Roos Bolton. And I think that is still the case now. Roos is suggesting this and, and Rob's like, all right, sure. Roos is the kind of guy where he's manipulative. Mm-hmm. And even though he's a small, pale, sickly-looking guy, he's very intimidating, creepy. And I think Rob agrees not because he really thinks about it and thinks it would be a good decision. He's just agreeing with Lord Roos because Roos is calm, collected, and definitely has had more success than he's had since their forces split up. Roos tells Catelyn more of the Trident. He was forced to cross in boats due to the flood. Gregor Clegane fell upon him before the crossing was done. Sir Willis had the rear guard, which was wiped out. Roos left a force of 600 men at the river, led by Ronald Stout and Sir Kyle Condon, who had been Lord Medgar Serwin's right-hand man. So Gregor cannot cross while the river is flooding. Lord Roos mentions Duskendale and blames Robert Glover for marching there independently when he learned that Deepwood Mott had fallen. Roos now has 500 horse, 3,000 foot remaining. Rob tells him they are going home after the wedding. And Roos is like, well, I am. I'm definitely going home. So where's the bullshit and where's the truth in what he's saying? Because we have to figure that deal's done at this point. Roos is going to be warden of the north. That's why he's heading. That's why he's heading home. So did Gregor Clegane really fall upon them? I think yeah, probably. But it's a setup. Like get rid of Willis Manderley because those are Stark men, the Manderleys. The guys that he's lost are true Stark loyalists. It's a story they'll believe. The rivers in flood, so Gregor can't cross. But he did get. Unfortunately, he got Sir Willis. It's like, oh, well, all right, well, thank God you're okay, Roos. <laughs> My loyal compadre. <laughs> For the reader, if the reader hadn't caught on yet. And I'm not saying that on the first read I did. On the reread I did. But if the reader hadn't caught on to Roos's attentions, when he tells the story of Robert Glover marching right, on Duskendale for one. revenge. That's the big one. Right, because he ordered Robert. He told Robert that our king wants you to march on Duskendale. Take your revenge on Duskendale. And now he's telling Rob that I don't know why he did it. I think he learned about Deepwood Mott. He went rogue. So the red flags all over the place. It's easy to see what's coming now, what's coming next. But it's still Ned's son. It's still the king in the north. Still undefeated on the field. And the phrases are so, f- they're so slimy and gross. Like, 
Rob has to be able to beat them. Right. They can't they can't pull this off. They can't pull off some sort of massacre like this. They wouldn't dream of killing Rob. There's, there's too many Northmen there. But it's so obvious looking at it. But the way George writes it, it's right there what's going to happen. The pieces in place, how they're put in place. But it's so muted. It's not in the forefront where you read it and you're like, oh shit, they're planning something. You get the vibe. You're uneasy. But you don't think that the Red Wedding is going to happen. So here we are. Catelyn 7. Personally, my favorite Catelyn chapter. I don't know about you. Oh, that's great. It's still a tough read. It's so surreal, too. Catelyn watches Aegon prance around to music that is too loud. She keeps noticing the musicians and how shitty they are. She sits between Sir Ryman Frey and Lord Roose Bolton on the dais. Sir Ryman is truly drunk. Lord Roos is only picking at his food. The wedding feast is poor. But Rob has been eating without complaint. Edmure and Rosalind appear pleased with each other. Rob is seated between Alex and Fairwalda. The wine is flowing freely. The Great John is drinking with Merrick Frey. Waylon Frey passed out trying to keep up. The Small John, Robin Flint, Patrick Malister, and Daisy Mormont are not drinking because they are serving as Rob's guards. Fatwalda is telling Sir Wendell how she became Lady Bolton. Which is another fucking red flag from thinking of Clash of Kings. Grey Wind is not there, as Lord Walder refused to let him in. Red flag. The Great John drinks Peter under the table and begins to sing loudly. Roos takes his leave to search for a privy. Rob asks Sir Ryman where Olivar is, as he hoped to have the lad squire for him again. Sir Ryman says he is gone. Catelyn mentions that she heard that one of his cousins was a singer, and Sir Ryman answers, that is Alessander, but he has gone too. Weird that the kids are gone. Mm -hmm. Sir Ryman takes his leave. Lord Walder claps his hands softly, and Sir Aenys, Sir Hostin, Lame Lothar, Sir Mark, Sir Danwell, and Sir Raymond begin pounding their cups on the table. Lord Walder announces that the betting should begin, and Rosalind goes white and begins to cry. Red flag. Rob agrees, and it begins with the Great John carrying Rosling to the bedchamber on his shoulder. Good for him that he did. That's the only reason he's alive, I think. <laughs> Catelyn stays behind, <laughs> as does Rob and a few others. Daisy taps Edwin and asks him to dance, but he pushes her away violently and says no. And Catelyn notices that, and she's like, what did I just watch? Catelyn takes off after him as the reins of Castamere begins to play. She grabs Edwin Frey's arm and feels mail, chain mail beneath it. She's already figured it out. She slaps mm -hmm. him, but he shoves her aside and walks on. It all makes sense to her. Olivar, Perwin, and Alessander gone. Rosslyn crying. Rob gets up to confront Edwin, but suddenly has a crossbow bolt sticking in his shoulder and another in his leg. He topples over. Small John gets a table over Rob to save him from three more bolts as Robin is surrounded by Freys who stab him to death and Sir Wendell is felled by a quarrel through the mouth. The small John attacks Sir Raymond with a leg of lamb but takes a bolt while reaching for his sword that brings him to his knees. Lucas Blackwood is felled by Sir Hostein while Black Walder takes out a Vance wrestling with Sir Harry's. Donal Locke, Owen Nori, and several others are felled by crossbow bolts while Sir Benfrey grabs Daisy who smashes him in the face with a wine flagon. She runs for the door, but Sir Ryman comes through with Frey men at arms and sinks his axe into Daisy's stomach. Northmen. This is fucking where it gets even more chaotic and confusing. Northmen begin right. pouring through the other door. Catelyn senses a rescue. Oh, they're here to rescue me. Until one of them decapitates the small child. Oh. Catelyn sees a dagger and goes for it, determined to kill Walder. At that point, Rob gets up. He has an arrow in his chest in addition to the other two. Walder signals a halt to the music and mocks Rob. The king in the north rises. Catelyn grabs Aegon Frey. Of all the people to grab, right? Of all the people to grab. She grabs the halfwit Aegon Frey and puts the dagger to his throat while calling out to Lord Walder and begging him to let Rob go. Promising he will take no vengeance. <laughs> no, 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 I promise. I promise. It's all good. Just let us go. For what has happened. She says she will kill Aegon if Rob is not allowed to leave. But Walder does not care. A man in red armor and a pink cloak walks up to Rob. Tells him, Jamie Lannister sends his regards. 
and thrusts his sword into Rob's heart. Catelyn keeps her promise and slits the poor half-wit's throat. Catelyn goes insane. I don't know if she goes insane. I think she kind of was insane. She begins <laughs> raking her face with her nails and sobbing uncontrollably. Someone says to put an end to it. Another person slits her throat. Quite the end. And, you know, we may have believed otherwise on an initial read, maybe even on a reread, have anger at House Frey and House Bolton. But at this point in time, it's the only way this could have ended for Rob and Catelyn. It was falling apart. Put an end to it. Slits her throat. You know, it's like you almost felt that it would have been way too good to be true if this is just going to be a wedding and mm-hmm. we're going to go back up north. If we're going to sing Kumbaya, we're going to get the north back. It was way too good to be true. Mm-hmm. And this chapter, the even way it starts off, it just there's something about the chapter when you read it. There's definitely something. You might write the first time. Even I didn't really know what was coming. You knew something was coming. Like, it yeah. just had that, the way George wrote it, that, that there was some sort of, something going on behind the scenes, so to speak. Well, the way, you know, the, the, I believe the chapter starts, the drums were pounding, pounding, pounding. Mm-hmm. Like, it's almost, it's, it's not that, that this chapter is so different from other chapters in any of these books let alone different from other Catelyn chapters. It's the same writer, the same story, but there is a a way that he writes this chapter where it is a bit surreal. From the first sentence, there's something a little bit off about it, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. I'm sure you've read Edgar Allan Poe in, in school. I, I don't want to put this. You can hear Slash play a couple notes on guitar. And you know it's him. You know it's him. You know, you hear Miles Davis play one note, on his fucking trumpet, you know it's him. You read a sentence by Edgar Allan Poe, you know it's Edgar Allan Poe, and it's not that he's the greatest writer of all time, but he's got this gothic horror style to his writing, and the Red Wedding chapter reminds me a lot of Edgar Allan Poe, a short story or poem, and you have half the people there, well, not quite half, but all the Northern people, they were uneasy at first, they feel comfortable now, and they're actually enjoying themselves. Catelyn's even... You know, she starts the the chapter off, she has a horrible headache, she doesn't feel good about it, but she starts to feel better as the chapter goes on. It's all fake. It's all set up. She even hears that the music is awful. Are these guys even, like, musicians? Right. They're not musicians. They just happen to know how to play just well enough to keep up the charade until they can shoot crossbows. And that's the whole chapter. Until that last moment, clue after clue after clue after clue, until it's too late. Like, you're already, you're in the snake pit. You've been in the snake pit. It's been coiling around you. It's been coiling around you since you let Jamie go. It all comes to a head. Since you let Jamie go, Rob married Jane Westerling, your kingdom, specifically your close allies, your car stars, Boltons, go figure. You know, you've been feuding with the Boltons for thousands of years. These great houses that were calling Rob their king, declaring him their king, following him on a march to King's Landing to rescue Ned. As soon as these decisions are made, free Jamie, marry Jane Westerling. They could see the writing on the wall, and they started making alternate plans to take advantage of this situation, and Rob just assumed they were with him. Catelyn, Rob, they both were able to see just far enough to see the problems in front of them, but they did not have the ability to look to their side, to look behind them. It was like a snake coiling around them since Catelyn let Jamie go. If you want to go back further, it's a snake coiling around them since Rob let Theon go. I mean, you could go back to, to any I mean, it, it all starts with Catelyn and go back to any one of her decisions that that's, that led them to this moment. Mm-hmm. What else is to be said about the Red Wedding? Do you think that Game of Thrones did it justice? Yeah, I mean, it definitely wasn't what I had envisioned when I was reading it. Right. I, I envisioned the room be a little bigger, a little wider, and may not so much, not longer, but wider. Yeah. That's how I envisioned it. You, you got the effect. You know, they didn't do a bad job with it. They did a really good job with it because it's going to go down as one of those most yeah, remembered TV that's... moments ever. But it's not as good as it was in the book because you don't get the characters like Daisy Mormon. Right. The great John. And it's pretty much just Edmure and Brendan and Catelyn and Rob and Talissa or whatever the fuck her name was. And it's more of a shock thing. And it's shocking. But you don't get the oh, just, uh... you, don't, you don't get the same heartache that you get reading the book. It's not just the king in the north and his mom. It's the whole north. Yeah, it's the whole north. These lawyers that were so loyal to Rob. 
their mistake also. So it's extra hurtful for Rob to die like that because it's not just him. It's his kingdom and it's his loyal men. They were foolish to follow him. And I got to hand it to Roose Bolton. He planned this out very well. It's obvious it's a trap, but they were able to keep the charade. It's too obvious to be a trap. No, it's a trap. It's definitely a trap. This is where the Catelyn Stark story ends, but she becomes something else. And let's go about it this way. After you read The Red Wedding, you finished The Storm of Swords, you got to the epilogue. Was it a surprise to you that Catelyn Stark was returned from the dead? Yes. I, and I actually, believe it or not, I did actually like this. You know, although it's like her coming back, but it was just like, you know, she don't speak, but she remembers. Love it. But like, see, as much as I loved it here, reading A Feast for Crows and A Dance of Dragons, you realize she's still going to be the same Catelyn. She's still going to mess up something. And any kind of incarnation of herself, she, she's not going to be able to help herself. Well, I feel like Lady Stoneheart's almost <laughs> really who she is. And Catelyn Stark is the mask, <laughs> you know? It's scary when you realize who she is. Let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. Instead of just going over this, let, let's just... What do you think is going to happen if and whenever we get Winter Winter with the whole Lady Stoneheart, Brianna Tarth, Jimmy Lannister meetup? Or do you even think maybe it doesn't even happen? Maybe they get cut off somehow. I, mean, I don't. That's. I, I doubt. It. I feel like this is going to happen. What do you think is going to happen? Since obviously the show has not even come close to touching this. That's a good question, dude. I don't know how the Lady Stoneheart's resolved. Like Jamie can't die during this. Can Bran die during this? Will they? Will they... It's possible. Um, or maybe Bran dies, and you we were talking about the the rumor that. Lady Stoneheart gives her kiss of life life to Rob, maybe. Lady Stoneheart gives that to Brienne or to Jamie. I don't want that to happen. But if they just beat her, how has that moved the story forward? What was the point of her? So there's got to be a point in her coming back. Right. I guess looking at the bigger picture, the Brotherhood Without Banners, they've changed. And now there is no more Lord Beric. Now it's Lady Stoneheart, a being of pure vengeance, leading them. And how will they play in the endgame? I know you've talked about Arya taking the Lady Stoneheart role and eliminating the phrase. So, yeah, maybe they eliminate a little phrase, but what else do they do? Do they join up and fight the others? Where do they go, no matter what happens with Jaime and Brienne? Where does the Brotherhood Without Banners go after that? The only thing that makes me think they'll have a, a, a bigger role than where they're at now is that Lord Beric and Thoros of Mir had gone north of the Wall with Jon. Yeah, so does that mean like Lady Stoneheart in the book goes north of the wall with John? And it just No, I don't think she does. I think she she is just a creature fueled by vengeance and she wants revenge on Jamie, and I think I want to think, could be very wrong, but I I want to think that this has more to do with Jamie's character arc and Jamie becoming the truest knight in the realm. He confronts Lady Stoneheart and he doesn't kill her. He's able to convince her that he's a changed man and that he tried to save Sansa and Arda and that he has not lifted a sword against House Stark or House Tully. He followed through with his deal. He had no intention of doing it, but in the end, he did. If he can convince Lady Stoneheart of that, where does Lady Stoneheart turn to then? Kill Freys? I mean, I would say that Lady Stoneheart is probably responsible for Walder Frey's death in. The Winds of Winter, or Dream of Spring, or what have you. Not Arya. And I think that will be kind of fitting for Catelyn. It's a cool idea, but it's also troublesome. How do you resolve Lady Stoneheart? How do you do that? Listen, I'm, I'm interested a lot, to read a lot of things in The Winds of Winter, but that, that was, I mean, I was interested to read a lot of things in The Winds of Winter. Less so now, because I already have my answers. Well, at least with this, it's since it's something the show has not even close, close to touching. It's definitely something that I'm looking forward yeah. to. That, like, you know, like you know, listen, I'm I'm still looking forward how how George does officially does the George the uh, the John resurrection. I'm I'm hoping it's different than what the show brought in. I, I really hope we get into a lot of the his working with ghosts and that combination will hopefully work is a lot better. Going, to, it's definitely going to be better. It's, it's yeah, it, culture. It's definitely going to be better. In the books. Well, it didn't really make a whole lot of sense in, in the show how, how he came no. back. It's never explained. No, first seen as man, then wolf, then, wolf, you know, then man again. And he just definitely didn't see that in the show. Right. We, haven't, we haven't seen Ghost in 
what, since season six? We didn't see him once. We didn't see no, him once season since season six, seven. Like episode three or four or something like that. This meme's going around on Free Folk. And listen, if you guys listen to our show or you haven't checked out the subreddit Free Folk, you know, named after the, the Wildings calling themselves Free Folk Beyond the Wall, check it out. Its brand memes aren't, aren't as good as they could be, but overall, these are the best memes out there right now for Game of Thrones, for anything really. But they have one meme that's been going around in a few different versions of what Ghost will look like in Season 8. <laughs> They've grown every year. So being that we didn't see Ghost in Season 7, they'll they'll do like a picture of John and then like a gigantic fucking ghost, <laughs> like big as a mountain, be like Ghost in Season 8. Like the Earth from space and like Ghost just like standing on it, like Ghost Season 8. As much as I'd like to see John and Catelyn, uh, John and Lady Stoneheart have a confrontation, I don't think we're going to get that. And that's okay. You know, it'd be nice, but I don't think we're going to get that. Let me ask you, why do you think they did not include this in Game of Thrones? Just too much? Uh, I guess probably too much. I think so. I, I, I really... That kind of gives you hope that whatever the story is going to be, it's going to be, you know, entertaining. It's going to be, you know, fulfilling. And just maybe, mm-hmm. at the same time, just nothing that really has much to do with the end game. Right. It's probably better to not include it at all than... To do it wrongly. To do it badly. Like, to dorn it. Right. And it also seen, like, for whatever reason, in season five, Brian Cogman, who I think is the big Dornish guy, just really wanted Jamie yeah. and Dorn for some reason. He really wanted to go with that storyline. I think he was just real enamored with Dorn. These guys are writing enough Game of Thrones every year. It's incredible how much Game of Thrones they write, especially considering that it's not exactly adapted anymore. It's an adapted property, but what they're writing is not adapted from anything. They don't have a book to base it on anymore. So Benioff and Weiss, Cogman's right up there with them, and of the four or five Game of Thrones prequel projects circulating, it's Cogman's who's I'm most intrigued with. I think Cogman has a good feel for this material, and I've heard that too, where he was the one that really lobbied for, for Dorne, and I guess it was on him to try and figure out a way to get Dorne involved. He didn't do a bad job, but hindsight, it would have been better to... Just not even do it, because not, you know what? I th- we, yeah. we said it before, to really effectively put Dorn in it, you would have had to have done Fagin. And that, just like Lady Stone out there, just, just seems like something they were just not going to do. Listen, they did a good job adjusting and changing it around, but it didn't add to the story. It didn't make the story better. You would need... Ariane, you would need Quentin. Yes. You would need a whole lot of characters. The character we care about the most, Prince Oberyn, you can get him without doing Dorn. Killing Dorn Martell and taking over Dorn and the girl power. And it wasn't dumb, but it wasn't that wasn't Dorn. It's like we'll watch the Ewok movie. Yeah, it's a Star Wars movie, but it's not it's not like really a Star Wars movie. It's just like the Ewoks. Yeah, so you're basically saying it's the last Jedi. Yeah, it's a Star Wars movie, but it sucks. Yeah. Ryan Johnson is taking over the, the very last season of Game of Thrones. This just in. This does wrap up Catelyn Stark, Catelyn Tully. The worst. Yeah. And I, I think we've proved our point. I think we've proved our point. She sucks. She's the worst. She's the worst. The redeeming qualities that we've talked about with her, which we haven't said, all right, well, one redeeming quality about her, but. I think I'm generally pretty fair and open-minded when it comes to characters, and I try to understand why they do the things they do. And Catelyn is just like, I don't know who she is. Like, What is she? How would you describe Catelyn? Besides saying she's the worst. Well, she loves her children. Okay. Does she? She says she does, but did she do anything that shows that she loves her children? She fought a guy with a knife. Yeah, but that guy would have killed her. And as soon as she was done, she left her son in a coma. And her little boy. Like, she's not that great of a mother. She's not courageous. She's not determined. Out for herself. She's arrogant. She's conceited. As you said, she's out for, you know, you just, you know, she, she's, everything she does, it just seems like, what's, what's the better good for Kyle and Tully? Everything else is secondary. Yeah. From my end, to wrap this up, what I'll say is this. Going back to when we first started talking about House Tully, comparing Catelyn and Cersei Lannister, I think is the best comparison to figure out who Catelyn Stark is because 
Mm-hmm. So she's a heel, a bad guy. When we first meet her, it's debatable when she starts having POV chapters if if she's still a bad guy, but she's more of an antagonist. And when you think of Cersei, you think of 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 a bad guy, some someone evil. But the decisions the decisions that Cersei makes aren't all that different from the decisions that Catelyn makes. And I'll say the redeeming quality that Cersei has that Catelyn does not is Cersei is at least fucking honest with herself. And honest with those that she considers allies. And maybe she's full of shit too. We don't know about the books yet, but she's all about protecting her children, protecting her children. Her children are all dead now and she's the queen. So she's sitting, it's almost like she's sitting pretty because of her children's death. So it's debatable if she really was doing all this to protect her children. But at the same time, she wasn't pretending to be something that she wasn't. Which Catelyn says one thing, acts one way, expects to be received one way, viewed as one way. Mm-hmm. But everything she does is the other way. Is the opposite of what she wants to be perceived as and act as. And it's funny how Catelyn gets perceived one way and Cersei gets perceived another way. But then it's all the same. Yeah. Cersei doing these horrible things, we don't get her point of view. But when you look at the bigger picture, when you have some of her point of views, Catelyn just looks worse and worse as the story goes on. What I love most about Lady Stoneheart is it really is an accurate reflection of of who she is on the inside as Catelyn Stark. She's got a stone heart. Lady Stoneheart. Out for herself, out for vengeance, one-track mind. Listen, Catelyn Stark, not the greatest written character, but I do think it is somewhat amazing that more people don't see her for who she is or blame her for the events of War of the Five Kings. It should be obvious to anybody that's read these stories and watched the show, it's Catelyn's fault. This is all Catelyn's fault. She's to blame for this. If you got to blame one person, I mean, you make a case for Robert, you can make a case for Rhaegar, but you make the best case for Catelyn Stark. What else you got, bub? I'm trying to think there's anything else we forgot. If there are things that we forgot, it's good, because I doubt this will be the last time that we spend time trashing <laughs> Catelyn Stark. <laughs> we'll definitely do it again. It'll be nice to have new material for it. But this was our most comprehensive look at the sheer and utter uh, stupidity of this character. We could spend time with Lady Stoneheart, but I don't think it's necessary. I think when we record again, our next episode will be more show-focused. And, although, technically, my math was wrong, this is technically episode 150. So, congratulations, John. Oh, this is 150. This this will be 150, yeah. But we will have a episode 150 celebration, which will be more show focused. I know you have a show you want to do before the spoilers really start coming out, so I think we'll do that probably next, right? Where we're, we're going to do the definitive: who lives, who dies, who lives, who's going to die, and it's not how things end up for them. It's just you live or die. And I think that'd be a lot of fun. We haven't been paying a whole lot of attention to. Game of Thrones news, not that there's been a lot, but we'll catch up with some production news. We just have those whole bunch of leaks, and I guess it's just a matter of which right. one's right, which one's not right. You know? We'll prepare that for the next episode, and uh, you know, we could maybe even touch on uh, on the American Tolkien, see what he's going on, because, uh, I mean, it's old news now, but we haven't even, you and I haven't talked about how he... <laughs> casually dropped that uh, The Winds of Winter won't be out in 2018. And I will say that this is the first time I've heard that The Winds of Winter won't be out this year that I'm not surprised. You know, it's fine. I was thinking about doing another reread. But I, I, I just can't. I don't think I have the motivation. I really yeah. don't. I, yeah. I just don't think I can go down there and and read it again because I think I'd just be filled with so much anger. I think it's easy to forget how great of a writer he is how great his world building is, how great his characters are, how cool his ideas are, because we're always so frustrated at him for leaving us hanging for years, for not making the fans of his writing his priority at the age that he's at. We'll talk about all that next time. You can find us facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. We're on Twitter at Princes Promised. We're on Tumblr. We're on Instagram. Read the Westerosi Companion at the Princes that were promised.com. 
Please find our show on Apple Podcasts. We're in the Google Play Store. We're on Stitcher. We are on SoundCloud. We are on YouTube. We are on, I think that's all of them. Subscribe to our show. Suggest it to a friend or a family member. Leave a review. John, always a pleasure. Thanks for listening. We will speak with you guys next time. Bum, 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 b